ओके वी गो लाइव नाउ गुड मॉर्निंग टू आवर गेस्ट डॉक्टर निशेला एंड गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल आवर पार्टिसिपेंट्स फ्रॉम इंडिया इट्स माय प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर टूडेज एमिनेंट साइंटिस्ट लेक्चर टुडे वी आर वेरी फॉर्चुनेट टू हैव विथ आस डॉक्टर मिशेला एज आवर एमिनेंट स्पीकर ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ डिरेक्टर सी एस आर निस्ट डॉक्टर शास्त्री एंड द एंटायर समर रिसर्च ट्रेनिंग प्रोग्राम टीम आई थैंक यू madam for accepting our request to deliver a lecture on the topic how to publish does and don't when writing a research article for uh, participants of csr srtp 2020 with this few words i once again welcome you all before uh, welcome you all and i would like to request mr rajesh to detail about srtp over to you mr rajesh Uh, thanks thanks biswajit uh, at the outset i would like to thank uh, uh, csir and dr shastri for giving us to opportunity to partner with the summer research training program i think which is very unique in terms of delivery you know uh, and also on the scale what we are trying to deliver this program is completely virtual uh, this is for the uh, students to do a uh, summer training program unlike earlier where they would participate in the laboratories this time they are doing it virtually because of the covid situation and over 14000 students have enrolled for this program uh, across different disciplines and it's a unique and very interesting pro project which has been uh, launched around 4 months uh, around 6 weeks ago and for the last 6 uh, weeks i think rsc and crsi have worked together and how we can support this program and bring that international participation and expertise to help the students in developing their skills as well as their knowledge for example i think we had our uh, acting ceo helen pain uh, talk about her career in leadership along with uh, we had also had a former president dominic who spoke on the career on his career as a computational chemist and today we have uh, my colleague michel will talk on various aspects of publishing paper which is very important for you as a going into uh, if you are going into career as an academic uh, in future as well i think these are some of the interesting tips which can be provided by michel in terms of how uh, publication can be done as well uh up in coming days uh, we really have an uh, interesting line of programs as well i think csr and rsc have lined up uh, an interesting program on a panel discussion on indian science in a post covid per, uh, era period uh, where we will discuss about the challenges upon opportunities which has come across because science is going through a different change right now i think uh, a lot of things have changed i think post covid era is going to be a much more different for science as well apart from that we will uh, tomorrow we will have another uh, interesting talk by our president elect uh, jill reed uh, she will be talking on uh materials uh, she is from university of southampton and she's been recently elected to uh, as a president to royal society of chemistry and hope you would all join tomorrow as well at 4 o'clock to listen to uh, jill reed uh with these words i would like to close and i would like uh, bispoji to continue with the program thank you mr rajesh uh, before i invite you dr michela to start her lecture i would like to request my colleague dr ajit singh to introduce the speaker dr ajit singh thank you bishuji uh, dr uh, dr mishra is uh, an executive editor for the several royal society of chemistry journals uh, such as uh, materials origin journal of material chemistry part a b and c and also for the nano scale nano scale she has been working with the royal society of chemistry since 2014 and uh, for the various rsc journals such as the rsc advances and uh, organic and biomolecular chemistry previous to that she has uh, studied in chemistry at the free university of berlin germany and uh, university of paris with france and obtained phd degree in bioorganic chemistry from the free university of berlin germany and uh, leibniz institute of molecular pharmacology germany uh, so what you uh, dr okay 
thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my slides with everyone. Okay. Welcome, everyone, and thank you very much for joining for this presentation. I hope it will be interesting to you to learn a bit more about publishing, what does it actually mean, what is behind this, and what do we actually do with your papers once they get submitted to us. So I'm planning to talk today about um, a few of things. I will give you a very short introduction to the Royal Society of Chemistry and our publishing program, um, as well as my role which will only hopefully take a few minutes. And then the main focus of my talk will be about um, publishing. So hopefully I will be able to give you a few tips on how to write a research paper, as well as um, how to choose a journal to submit to, um, what are the things you need to take into account, as well as what happens actually to your manuscript after you've submitted to us. Um, so as a first part, I would like to give you uh, an overview of um, the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, we are a society and initially we were funded, uh, founded as a membership society. So m the main part of what we're doing is we're there to really be there for scientists, connect them with each other and support them uh, in their role as researchers as much as we can. As part of this, um, we have a publishing uh, department. So our aim is to publish new research and disseminate it to the community as quickly as possible and to help you with that and help you to for others to find your research as much as possible. Um, we really, our, driv our vision is to really bring people together to help them to develop new ideas and new partnerships and with that, we're also supporting a lot of um, events. We're organizing events where we're trying to bring people together. Um, and with that, also uh, supporting university programs such as um, yours. Um, we also work a lot in education. We're supporting chemistry teachers all over the world, uh, including uh, programs that we're running in India to support future generations in chem chemistry. And we also have um, staff members who are very involved in um, policies, science policies, who are trying to support political decisions um, in the area of science with um, knowledge and any kind of um, reports that we can put together for you. Um, so yeah, as a summary, we can say we're a not-for-profit organization. So um, all the revenue that we make, we're trying to put back into the community due to the different activities that we're running. And um, we really have a very strong reputation from over 200 years of um, being a membership society. And we're really trying to support the chemistry community as much as possible in a lot of different ways. Um, we're a very global organization. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of um, where we are based. So we have a lot of offices all over the world. Our main office, of course, our oldest office is in London, um, Burlington House. If you are in London, you can come and visit as well. Um, and our main office is in Cambridge as well. We also have an office in Bangalore, where Rajesh, for example, is based. Um, and a lot of other staff members that you might have met throughout the last years or will be meeting hopefully uh, throughout your future careers. And we have a few offers in other parts of the world as well. And we're really trying to work very closely together to uh, support you um, and other researchers as much as possible. Um, we're also a, a leading international publisher as part of this, as I mentioned, so we publish um, books. As you can see, there are different books. Um, some of them are popular science in, uh, for example, chemistry and murders and murder investigations. Some are more um, um, knowledge science books, such as surface chemistry of colloidal nanocrystals. We have quite a few series um, of different science books. We also publish journals, as you will know, and different databases, such as the Merck Index and ChemSpider as well as our membership magazine, Chemistry World. Um, 
So having a look at publishers, of course, we're not the only publisher in um, chemistry and in the community. There are different publishers, and I've just summarized um, the four main publishers for you here. And so there are differences between them. Some of them are society publishers, and some of them are more commercial publishers. Um, uh, society publishers are those that um, are trying to put the revenue back into the community, whereas commercial publishers work more for a um, general benefit. Um, there have, uh, the, as you can see, the Royal Society of Chemistry is quite an old publisher compared to some of the others. We've been around for almost uh, 200 years now and have just celebrated last year our 175th anniversary. Um, and we're currently publishing about 47 international chemistry journals. So what does a publisher actually do? Um, I thought I'd give you a bit of an overview of what we're actually doing so you can understand our work a bit better. So our main purpose is really to support the community by providing you journals uh, which offer access to the latest research and as that as well as authors provide for you a venue where you can publish your research that other people can then access and read. Um, we uh, work together with authors to support them in um, publishing their work with us. Um, as part of this, of course, we also give talks like this one today to help you in making the most of um, the paper that you're submitting to us and making sure that the chances of getting accepted in our journals is as high as possible. Um, as part of this as well, we of course manage submissions. Once you submit to us, we manage your manuscripts, um, send them to, through the peer review process. Um, as part of this, we recruit, train and support our editors and editorial boards um, that are handling your manuscripts through peer review. Um, some of those will be professional editors and some of those, depending on the journal, will be uh, researchers in the community that you might be familiar with uh, called associate editors and scientific editors. Um, we also, after your paper gets accepted, hopefully, we edit, typeset and produce issues um, to disseminate your research. Um, and part of this is as well, not just publishing those issues, but this isn't where our work stops. But we also look into making sure that people find your research. So we're working um, with databases, making sure that your articles are indexed in as many databases as possible. And um, we also um, run different visibility activities where we're trying to um, disseminate your publications to as many researchers as possible to make sure they get read. Um, and hopefully help other people further in their own research. Um, and yeah, so with that, we do a lot of um, promotion of your, of your um, articles that are published with us. And we work very closely with marketing and sales as well to make sure that um, we really, um, you get the most out of publishing with us. Um, and also, we're not just um, doing all of this and using the mean the same techniques that we've used for the last 20, 30 years, but we're constantly trying to innovate and develop new technologies to make this process for you as easy as possible and to develop new author tools as much um, on an ongoing basis. And I'm going to talk about this a bit at the end of the talk as well, if you're interested. Um, so yeah, how how do we actually support um, the publishing process and add more value to it as publishers? So hopefully we are providing you with a trusted brand of journals and a trusted publisher name. So you know that what we, the work we do is really um, of good quality. And um, we provide you with an online submission system and different author services initially. I'm going to go into more detail a bit in, in the next slides. Um, before you actually submit your articles to us. As I mentioned before, we're recruiting, training and supporting editors in their work on um, doing the peer review and processing your manuscripts in the best um, way and fit most fair way as well. Um, we make sure that we like if there are any problems, we liaise between all different parties to make sure that this process is as fair as po possible and also as neutral as possible and make sure that we actually maintain integrity in the literature in terms of looking at any potential scientific problems or ethical problems as well. Um, and as I mentioned before as well, we're arranging um, after acceptance services such as editing, 
type set setting and proofreading so that you don't need to worry about any of this before you submit to us. Um, and in the end, we host your articles on our platform and ensure that they're um, visible in as many databases and through as many means as possible afterwards. So my role as the, at the Royal Society of Chemistry is I'm the executive editor. So I manage a portfolio of journals, which are the core materials and nanoscale journals, non-science journals that we're publishing. And um, as part of this, what I'm doing is I'm working with our editorial boards. Um, I'm also involved in the process of signing that um, and recruiting the editorial boards and work with them really on the strategy of the journals as well as um, make sure that the peer review and our guidelines are as solid as possible for you to get a fair uh, peer review process. Um, so the editorial board are usually active researchers in the field. Um, they're um, researchers all over the world. And when we uh, look at new, recruit, um, new recruits for the editorial board, we always take into account the general scope of the journal to make sure that our overall editorial board covers all the different subject areas that we publish in the journal. And we also um, use the editorial board to, um, sorry, I lost the track. Um, we also look at, of course, diversity um, to make sure that our editorial boards represent our author base as much as possible. So we look at diversity in terms of geography and gender and the other means to make sure that you feel as a community represented through the editorial boards as much as possible of our journals. We also commission work to the journal, so we invite authors to submit to the journal, be it um, general research articles, for example, for themed issues, but also review articles from experts in the field. And of course, as mentioned before, um, my team works very closely on making sure that we promote the research that you publish with us, be it in themed issues, article collections, but also any other promotion at conferences and any other means that we can think of through social media and things like that. And we really work very closely with our editors to ensure we have a very rigorous and fair and efficient peer review process. And so any feedback that we get from you is um, very valuable to us. And so as part of this, we go out to conferences, we talk to you as much as possible, and we're always happy to get feedback from you through our uh, through emails as well and any other means uh, to make sure that the processes that we're offering are as fair uh, as possible. And we're constantly looking at um, reviewing those processes if there are problems that we're identifying. Um, and yeah, as part of going to conferences, we also try to keep, of course, on top of what's happening in the field, um, listen to research talks, talk to researchers about their uh, the developments in, in the different fields that we're publishing in. And as I've said before, as part of this um, talk as well, advise researchers on best practice and publishing and how to make the most out of um, publishing as well. Okay, um, this is just a very quick overview of the journals that I'm personally working on. So these are the kind of core materials journals that we're, that I'm working on, um, which is our highest impact journal, Materials Horizons, which publishes really exceptional high quality research, as well as our journals of materials chemistry, A, B, and C. They all focus, they're our largest, most established materials chemistry journals and they focus on different application areas of the materials chemistry. Um, so A is focused on energy and sustainability, B is focused on materials chemistry for purpose in biology and medicine, and C is focusing more on optical, magnetic and electronic devices as well as things like photonics. Um, and then I'm also managing our nanoscience journals, um, nanoscale horizons, similar to materials horizons as our highest impact nanoscience journal, publishes everything across nanoscience and nanotechnology, as well as nanoscale, which hopefully a lot of you have come across already, which are our largest and most established nanoscience journals. Just to say on the note, we also have um, two new journals launched that don't directly are managed by me, but there are our two new open access journals, Nano Scale Advances and Materials Advances, that sit um, below Nano Scale and the day journals of materials chemistry in impact. Okay, um, coming on to the main part of my talk. Um, 
you might wonder, depending on which career stage you are at, you might wonder, why should I publish my work? What's the benefit of actually doing this? So there are a few different reasons, and some of those might be more important to some of you than others. So um, just to, I've put together a little summary of the main reasons that we get from the community why publishing is so important. Um, first of all, of course, when you're doing research, uh, there's no benefit in just keeping the res results to yourself. Um, it's really important to share any results that you have with the community and make sure that they can build on those results and um, advance the field as much as possible. So you're really contributing to the general advancement of the field by sharing your results with other scientists and allow them to use them for their own research. Um, also, it's kind of establishing scientific priority to um, sharing results might drive a field in one direction or another by sharing positive or negative results. And as much as contributing to the kind of general advancement of science, you're also kind of um, creating a permanent record um, for yourself. So a, a publication is kind of a permanent record that says these are um, results that have been validated by the community, by reviewers, and they're also a way of saying, I have met, done those results and they've been validated. So you're creating your own record of um, publication. Um, it's a means of generally yeah, sharing information, as I've said, furthering your career by developing your own record of publications. And for many people, um, it's also a way of procuring funding. So when you're applying for funding grants, you use um, you can show your publication record in the field to really show that you have expertise in the area that you want to grant in. And uh, throughout the grant period, you're also showing that you're actually using the money to um, advance research and you're publishing in the field um, that you got received the money for. So for that, it's a very important record as well. And generally as well to just promote your own self and your research. So once you've decided that you want to submit a paper, there are a few things you need to take into account when making a decision on um, where to submit. And so a few different things that you need to take into account when making these decisions, um, I've summarized here. There are, for example, things like the peer review policy. Um, I will go into a bit more detail what that actually means on the following slide. There's also potentially reputation. Um, do you personally care about if you were published with a reputable publisher, with a very well-known journal, or are you happy to, for example, publish in a new journal um, with a new publisher? Um, do you care about open access? Um, open access usually means um, that in many journals it comes with an article processing charge, but on the other hand, it means that anyone, no matter if they have a subscription to a journal or not, anyone can read your research, can um, refer to your research based on that, and so you're making your research more visible to others. So you have to think about is that important to you, and all the other potentially funder requirements as well to publish open access. Then, of course, you need to think about the scope of the journal. Um, do you think the research, your results are more for a specialized uh, community? Um, or do you think they're actually um, results that are more interesting to a general community, general chemistry community, or even the general science community? Based on that, you might decide to publish in a, a journal just such as Chemical Science, which publishes everything across all chemical sciences. Or you might actually decide, I think my research is more suitable to a more specialized field. They will value it much more. And so I might want to go to a more specialized journal, for example, to a more specialized materials chemistry journal, such as the Journal of Materials Chemistry, A, B, or C. Now, these are things you need to take into account before you actually decide to write your paper. Um, also, things like publication times. Do you care about how quickly you get a decision, or are you happy to wait a bit longer? You can usually find find this information on publishers and journal web pages, or you can just email the inboxes of the journals and just say, um, ask those questions, and you should usually get answers on those. Um, things like cost come into play. Um, as I mentioned already, some open access journals um, come with costs. Not all of them do. Um, also, there are sometimes additional costs. Some publishers charge for things like um, colored images 
or any other things. So you, it might be worth looking at that as well. Um, the language uh, might be something you want to consider. Do you want to publish in English? Or do you prefer to publish in a journal that is in a different language? And this depends again at what community you read and um, how many people do you think will be able to read your article and you want to be able to read your article. Um, other people might uh, care about uh, citations. Um, how many citations do papers on average get um, in different journals? Um, I have to say that citations are quite arbitrary. An impact factor does not always reflect how often your article will be cited. It is an average. And so um, just basing your decision on an impact factor does not mean that your specific article will receive that many citations. Um, also, you might want to look at things like indexing. I've mentioned before databases. So every publisher um, makes deals with different databases, such as Web of Science, Scopus, Medline, and any other more specialized databases, such as ProQuest, um, to make sure that their articles are indexed in those. And people who search articles through those in databases are able to find your research. So this is something you might be interested in if you feel like your field, for example, uses a specific database a lot, you might want to publish in a journal that is actually indexed in that database to make sure that people discover your research. And last but not least, you might care about the format, how the article format looks like in the published way, but also the format that you might have to submit uh, papers in. For example, if you submit a manuscript to any Royal Society of Chemistry journal, you usually do not need to submit it in a specific template, except for Chemcom, which needs templates uh, for their communications, but otherwise we don't require templates which does potentially save a lot of time when you're preparing your manuscript to be submitted. So these are things you might want to take into account as well. So I've, I realize these are quite a lot of things and some points you might personally care more than others, but these are things you should take into account and identify for yourself personally before deciding which journal you want to publish in. Um, so one of the things you might want to think about as well is why do you generally want to use peer review? So the benefits of peer review as well are, as an author, um, if you publish in a journal with peer review, it means that you have a validation process for the science that you publish. Hopefully you have re reviewers who read carefully um, your manuscript, look through your data and validate that the data and the conclusions uh, are in line. It's a way of potentially improving your article as well. A good reviewer report often makes suggestions as well on how you can improve your article in terms of making it more understandable to the reader, but also in terms of making um, your claims more solid uh, based on the data that you're presenting. And um, also for you as a reader, of course, it means that if a paper got went through peer review, you know that the science that you're reading is hopefully reproducible and valid. Um, and so it is more of a stamp of quality when you're thinking about um, using that research in your own lab. Um, as a reviewer as well, um, so a lot of the feedback that we get why people like to review manuscripts, of course, it's a way of seeing research really, really early before it gets actually published and accessible to the community. So if you're working as a reviewer, you might see papers, you see papers before they get published, you get kind of an early um, view of the field, what might be coming up. Um, a lot of people see, see it as a professional activity as well. You can put it on your CV as um, you are reviewing papers for certain journals. And you can also keep track of this on different uh, databases, your reviewing activities. And some people just enjoy reading new work. Um, so th these are all things that kind of help you in deciding if you want to go for peer review. And I personally think it's a very good thing to do. Um, but I might be biased because I work for a publisher. Um, so yeah, if you look at different peer review models, I've mentioned that you might want to take those things into account and depending on how familiar you are with publishing, um, you might not have thought about this previously. So I thought I'd just give you a quick overview of what they actually are. So um, most journals nowadays use a single blind peer review model. What that means is that the um, authors submit their paper 
to the journal and the editor can see the name of the author and the names of the reviewers they're selecting and um, the papers and the reviewers can see the name of the author as well and the editor um, but what's important about this is that the author cannot see the name of the reviewer so the reviewer reports are anonymized and so when the author receives a reviewer reports they don't know who actually submitted the reviews. This is the most traditional and standard peer review model now in the field. Um, there are a lot of um, downsides to that sometimes. So sometimes authors feel that by reviewers being able to see who they are and where they're based, where their institution is, that there might be a bit uh, some bias towards them, depending on where they're based or who they are. So there is some journals offer, for example, double blind peer review, which means that the reviewer still is anonymized, but it also means that the author is anonymized. So for example, um, Chemcom um, of offers um, put a, the option of double blind peer review. So you can submit your paper to Chemcom and you can decide that you do not want reviewers to know who you are. But um, that comes with a responsibility for you as an author as well, that you have to anonymize your paper. So you have to, you cannot in your manuscript say, our research group has recently um, worked on this and, and found those previous results that we're now basing this new paper on, um, because that would, of course, give away who you are as an author. So you need to make sure that if you do opt in for double blind peer review, um, that you anonymize your paper and make sure that an author cannot guess from the way your paper is written who you are. Otherwise, it is not really double blind. And then last but not least, one of the options we have as well is transparent peer review. This is something we've very recently introduced for our new journal, RSC Chemical Biology. And it means that um, once a paper gets published in the journal, um, the editor's decision letter, as well as the reviewer comments and the author's response um, to those comments is published alongside the article. That's currently optional, but some journals as well um, have this as a um, oblig obligatory thing. So if you do publish in those journals, um, all these things will be published and reviewers have the option as well to opt in and sign the reviewer reports with their name at the end of the process. So these are just um, the three main different um, peer review models and you might want to take into account one or the other um, when you decide on which journal to submit to. Um, okay, then there are also other um, another aspect of peer review models. So you might have already noticed when uh, you looked at journals um, that the handling of manuscripts through peer review is done through different types of editors. So there are some journals that use professional editors solely to do the peer review of the manuscripts. Um, and those are professional editors that have usually a background in the sciences. For us, it would be someone with a background in natural sciences and chemistry um, that have are trained properly on peer review and have a good understanding of the field and um, the subject matter. And they work in our Cambridge office um, and do peer review. So some of those as examples are, for example, Nature Materials, Angewandte from Wiley, or for us as well, Energy and Environmental Science. Then there are some journals that are based on, they use associate editors. Those are active researchers, as mentioned before, in the field. And um, they do all the peer review they, um, of the manuscripts for the journal. Examples for this are, for example, Chemical Science and RSC Advances at the Royal Society of Chemistry. and there are journals that have a mixed bag. So some of the manuscripts will go, uh, will be handled by professional editors and some of the manuscripts will be handled by associate editors. And usually upon submissions, you have the chance to um, give a preference for one or the other. And that will be taken into account when your manuscripts gets assigned to an editor. So I just want to give you a bit of an overview. Um, we have quite a lot of journals, of course, at the Royal Society of Chemistry. And with that, we have quite a lot of associate editors. And I just wanted to give you a small snapshot of some of the associate editors that are working with us to show you really that we have people all over the world working with us. In India specifically, we have 12 associate editors currently. 
and 16 editorial board members that are working with us actively on our journals. Um, okay, so um, once we're done with that introduction, I thought I wanted to give you a bit of an overview as well of now that you've potentially decided which journal you want to submit to, how do you actually go about to write your article and prepare your article? Um, okay, there are a few things to take into account when you write your paper that you should be thinking about before you start. Uh, the first thing is, I've mentioned before, that there are different journals that might be appealing to different audiences. For example, if you want to submit to something like chemical science, um, you will potentially have a general chemistry audience that will, might be reading your article. Whereas if you're submitting to a more specialized journals, journals such as the Journal of Materials Chemistry A, you have a more specialized audience that will be reading your article. This is something you should take into account as well when you're writing a research paper. So especially in the introduction, you need to think about who is going to read my paper and how much background information do they need to understand what I'm actually, uh, what I've done. So for example, if you want to publish in chemical science, you might want to give a more general introduction into the field and why what you're doing is important in your specific field to an audience that doesn't, might not have the background knowledge to understand those problems in your field. Uh, whereas in if you publish in a more specialized journals, you might in the introduction be able to skip that part and start with a more specialized introduction overall. Um, this will really help as well, not just um, for the reader later on, if your paper gets accepted, but also for the editor handling your paper, who are generally experts in the field, but the more um, general the journal gets, the more wider is the expertise of the single editor as well when they're handling papers. Um, one thing to take into account as well is use very simple language um, and make sure you compare your work to the state of the art. A lot of the papers that get submitted to us get um, rejected without being sent out for peer review, just basically because the introduction doesn't give a good um, comparison to the state of the art currently. Please do make sure that you, before submitting your paper to us, to any journal, you um, check that the references are up to date and anything that's recently been done in the field is referenced in your paper and that you really compare to any um, recent developments in the field and the state of the art before you submit it. Because it's, it's very sad when we have to reject papers that might be um, really good science and really good results and new, but we're basically unable to see that from the paper because there's just the comparison missing for the editor and the reader to really state what has been done before and what is really new in your paper. Um, especially the references, I always say, I know um, it's very um, unlikely for many people that you submit your paper the first time and it gets accepted. Often your paper might get rejected from a journal and you go to submit to a different journal after. And sometimes uh, that the period in between might be a few months, um, depending on how long your paper has been in peer review with the first journal. Before you submit um, your manuscript to a new journal, do make sure you check the record again, check the recent um, references and anything that has been done in the literature in the last months, and make sure before you submit your manuscript to a new journal that you update the references with any potential new records in the literature, because this happens quite a lot. And it's, um, it's a pity if we then have to reject a paper because it's just not referring to the most recent work done um, and you don't have a chance to defend your new results to that work. Um, yeah, things to take into account as well, of course, is um, novelty and impact requirements of different journals, as well as make sure to check the spelling and grammar of your work. Um, do make sure to use um, programs that can do like a general grammar and spelling check um, that avoids any um, unnecessary mistakes and also make sure that uh, you might give other people the chance to read your paper before you submit. Um, we have a general guide um, on how to publish. I've put a link in on here, um, but if uh, we can disseminate that to you as well if you ask us and you can find it on our general um, author pro Port, um, author port as well on the web page if you go on our pages. Um, okay, so once you've taken all that into account, um, 
let's look at the structure of a paper. So a paper is generally um, structured in a few different points, and you might be quite familiar to that depending on how much literature you're currently reading. And I do encourage you to read quite a lot of um, research and papers because that makes sure that you familiarize yourself with the structure as well and how to write a good paper um, and learn from other people. So yeah, generally what you have is you have a title, you have a, an author list, um, you have a short abstract that summarizes uh, very concisely the work that you've done, um, followed by an introduction into the field and what you're actually trying to do, what the problem is. Um, you then describe your results in a discussion format, um, followed by potentially an experimental part. In some journals, the experimental part will be in the supplementary um, information and not in the actual manuscript. And then in the end, you have conclusions that kind of have a future looking way um, as well and acknowledgement and references. And what I always say is when you start writing a paper, the first thing, thing you should start with is uh, the introduction. That gives you a chance to really look into the recent literature, update your on the state of the art, what has recently been done and write about what is it actually, what is the problem that you're trying to address with your research that you're summarizing in this article, what has been done and why is your research so important based on what's been done previously and what people are trying to achieve. And that really gives you a really good mindset when you then go into uh, writing the results and discussions, because ideally in your results and discussion part, you will refer back to what has been done uh, by then describing what have you actually done and achieved and how does that um, make a difference to the state of the art previously published. Um, in After that, I always say, after you've written that, um, I would always then write the conclusions. And um, the conclusions are kind of meant to give you a summary of what you've described in results and discussion, and then have a kind of future looking point as well to say, so think about what do the results now mean for the future of that field and where could they potentially lead? Um, what new um, venues might they open? What new ideas might they spark to look into? And what new ap applications might they open up to? After that, after you've written your whole paper, um, at the end, I would always focus on the title and abstract. Um, because after you've done all that, you have a really good idea of what you've actually been, um, the story you've been telling and um, what is it actually you want to communicate to the community with your research article. And after that, it's much easier to then think about the overall title and abstract of your paper. So when you think about the title, uh, one thing I always say is um, think about as a reader what might spark your interest and uh, what might make people interested in reading your papers. And I've put a few examples together here just to give you an idea of different titles you could be using for a paper and which are more or less efficient. So for example, if you look at the first um, title, it says super amphiphobic coatings prepared by the combination of polygorskite and organocyanes. So what does that title actually tell you? It tells you that um, what you're describing in your manuscript is you've made some coatings that are super amphiphobic by using the two starting materials called polygoskites and organosilanes. Um, it's not very exciting, except if you're really, really interested in super amphiphobic coatings. Um, so one other potential title you could use if you're looking at the last one is novel super amphiphobic coatings. So you're telling someone you've made, uh, this article is about new super amphiphobic coatings. But if you think about this, this actually could be a research article, but it could also just be a review article. It could be a summary of recent results um, of super amphiphobic corporate coatings. And it doesn't really tell the reader much of why they should care about reading your article. Um, at the same time, if you look at the third title, um, it says fabrication of super amphiphobic coatings under PAL 1H, 1H, 2H, 2H, perfluor, desyl, triethoxysilane, and tetraethoxysilane. Again, 
uh, is a very complicated <laughs> title that tells you you've made some super amplifier coatings from very specific starting materials, but it doesn't really spark interest. So think about what really needs to be in the title and what is actually not necessary. Um, so I've also put in an um, update, um, a, a potential uh, title that might be a bit more suitable. So if you look at the second one, the second title reads, Dur durable and self-healing super amphiphobic coatings repellent even to hot liquids. So what that tells you is you're not mentioning the starting materials because the starting materials aren't necessarily important for this. Um, but you tell people that you've made super amphiphobic coatings and people who work in the field should care about them because they are durable, they are self-healing, and they are even repellent to hot liquids, which might be a problem that you've been specifically trying to address in your paper. So you're really drawing the attention of people that are working in the field and trying to develop those coatings that are self-healing and durable and repellent to, for example, hot liquids, and tell them, we've achieved that, please read our article. So these are the things you should take into account when you're writing a title. Um, okay, similarly, once you've written, you decided on your title, the next thing you need to do is to finish your paper is the abstract. A lot of people ask me, um, what's the difference between the abstract and the conclusions? Because both of them are basically summaries of your paper. And so the difference really is that an abstract is more um, giving an introduction into the problem of the paper and what you've achieved, whereas the conclusions are more giving a summary of what you've achieved and what that means for the future, potentially with an outlook of um, what you could do in the future based on those results. So, um, and something again you need to take into account is um, if you're the reader, um, how does an abstract might help you to decide to read an article and also an editor that receives your article, the first thing they're going to see is the title and the abstract of your paper. So how can you convince reader and an editor that your manuscript is inter of interest, suitable for the journal to be sent out for peer review, for example, but also interesting for a reader to read and potentially add to their repertoire. And um, so what you should do in a good abstract is basically you should, it's a bit of a very, very short summary of your introduction. So you should, should set objectives of what were the problems in the field that you're trying to address. You should give a very concise summary of the key findings in a very in a single paragraph in one or two lines, and then emphasize the significance and potential impact of that. Um, and what I always say is, if someone tries to decide to either send your paper out for peer review, but also if they want to read your article later on once it gets published, um, they will never see your abstract alone. They always see your title with your abstract. So do not use your abstract as a repetition of your title um, and just use the same phrase, but use it really to convey additional information to your title because everyone will already see your title and is not going to make it difference. You don't have to repeat that in your abstract. And as well for your abstract, but also your title, one thing to take into account is use recognizable words and phrases, especially if you're appealing to a more general audience. Do not use um, common abbreviations in your fields, acronyms, and um, very specialized words, and try to be as um, as understandable for the general uh, community as you can. Um, as an example, NMR, you can is, I mean, NMR is something everyone knows, so you'll probably get away with that. But if you use anything like PCR, um, which is a polymer chain reaction, a lot of people will not understand what that means. And so it might be worth spelling that out in your title to make people aware of what you're actually about. Um, and I've just um, put together a few uh, examples of abstracts and I'm just going to go through one of them so you get a bit of a feeling of um, what I actually mean when I say these things, what you should include. So I'm just going to refer to the middle abstract, um, which um, gives you a bit of an idea of what you should be including in um, 
your general abstract. So it starts with a very, very short introduction and setting the importance, which says recent theoretical works predict the ability of surface phonon polaritons to increase ter thermal conduction along nanoparticle chains, but measurement of this effect has proven elusive. So what you're doing in one sentence is you're introducing of this is a this is a common field of research, a problem we're trying to and this is the problem we're still trying to address. Um, then in the next part, you're, you're talking about your objectives and aims. So you're saying here we demonstrate a new approach to observe thermal conduction by surface phonon polaritons, uh, packed beds of silica nanoparticles. So you're basically saying this is what we're trying to do in our papers. This is our objective. Um, so we are basically trying to address this problem we've pr specifically mentioned before. And then you just have one or two sentences that summarize your key findings. So in this uh, part, you say, when we modify the in interstitial material with adsorbed water or a coating of ethylene glycol, we experimentally resolve thermal conductivities as high as 1.5 and 18 times the phon phonon value, respectively. So you're then giving a qu quick summary of your key findings. And this is really how your abstract should be um, structured and what you're trying to achieve to get people's attention. So you're trying to draw in people by giving them a general idea of what the problem is, then telling them what you've tried to do, and then get going in a bit more detail what you've actually achieved. OK, so I've spoken about language in general a bit and said keep the language simple and keep the sentences as short as possible. Uh, and I am speaking from experience because I'm German and Germans love long sentences and very complicated sentences over four or five or six lines. Um, and as a foreign speaker, um, for you're not, it's very difficult to follow those sentences if you're not used to the language. So really try to avoid any kind of complicated sentences and try to break up what you're trying to say in your sentences in as, as short a chunk as possible. So say things like, we have, we have synthesized these. Uh, we, uh, we, have the, we have used them in this application and then um, try to cut up your sentences as much as possible because it makes um, it much easier for an editor, a reviewer, but also a reader later to follow what you're trying to say and what you've achieved. And um, the more complex your co sentences will be, the more difficult it will be to understand them. And it also means that um, when you submit a manuscript and an editor reads it initially, as well as if it gets sent out to peer review to a reviewer, it adds another edge of stress to them and it might influence their decision on your paper if they have to reread a sentence multiple times to understand it it just um, makes it more leaves a negative imp impact and might make a uh, an impact on the decision on your overall paper so if they're on the fence of saying accept or reject or sending it out for peer review or not then um making the paper as easy to understand as possible can make a difference to s sway someone into um, deciding for the kind of positive of that choice. Um, in addition, what I would say is try to be very specific to help with that simple sentence structure. Don't uh, use words like this and that and refer back to things you've mentioned in previous sentences that make it more difficult to follow what you're talking about. But don't be afraid to just reuse words and be very specific with every sentence that you're using. And also try to avoid unnecessary run-on phrases, run sentences and phrases such as, as a matter of fact, in order to, um, because it just makes the whole um, text more complex and more difficult to follow. And if you reread your art, your paper in the end, and you feel like you can take out a sentence and you still say the same, then just take out the sentence. Because if a sentence doesn't add anything to what you're trying to say, it basically makes it redundant and you can just remove it. Um, OK, one thing to mention as um, well is the authorship. So. Before you submit a paper, please do make sure that you consider the authorship of the paper properly. Um, every journal has authorship guidelines that you can check on their journal pages. If you cannot find them, feel free to always email any journal and they'd be happy to 
uh, send you a link to the guidelines. Um, make sure you have all the authors listed on the author list that have made a significant contribution to um, the research presented in the paper. Um, check that you haven't missed anyone that has worked on the project over the last years. Um, one thing to take into account as well is ORCID IDs, um, which is something we're asking for when, when you submit, which is a researcher ID um, that you can get more information on as well on our web pages. Um, and please do take into account to if someone doesn't have made hasn't made a significant contribution um, to potentially remove them from the author list, but make use potentially of the um, acknowledgement section. So you can add people who've helped with small things in the project, but aren't um, don't necessarily qualify as an author of the paper. You can add them to the acknowledgement section and make sure you acknowledge their help on the work as well in um, in an appropriate manner. Um, as well, take into account that once a manuscript is published, any author on the paper takes public responsibility for the work presented. Uh, and with this in mind, make sure that all the authors that are listed on the manuscript have seen the manuscript in the final version before submission and approved it to avoid any problems later on. Um, in addition, have a look at data requirements for submission for different journals. Again, um, these should be listed on publisher home pages, but also on the journal web pages. Uh, make sure you have all the data required um, before you submit to a journal. If you're unsure about what data is required, again, feel free to um, email the journal and inquire about that. And look at um, usually if repositories are necessary important or are requested, the publisher or journal would tell you which repositories might be appropriate. Um, any other data, make sure to include that in the electronic supplementary information to ensure that any kind of conclusions and results you're presenting in your paper is actually backed up with data and reviewers are able to look at that data and um, understand if those conclusions match the data um, from their judgment or not. Um, yeah, so our own policy is we do encourage authors to deposit as much data as possible related to their research and make it available to the public uh, record. Um, some of those might be uh, as recognized subject specific repositories might be ChemSpider or PubChem. Some uh, universities have institutional repositories and there are also general repositories such as Figshare or Dryad. So please do consider using any of these for your data um, when you're writing a manuscript as well. Well, But you can see, see a full list of our data policy also on our author and reviewer hub, or as well email any of us and we are able to um, provide you with any advice on this. Okay, so now uh, you've written your manuscript, you've decided which journal to submit to initially. So now you're ready for submission. Um, so what you should do is check that you actually have everything. And there are a few more things that you will need before you can submit to a journal that you should take into account. The first thing is, of course, your manuscript. So if you're done with that, that's great. Um, one thing to say is um, before you're ready with your manuscript, do make sure you give your manuscript to other people to read um, before you submit it. Because if you if you've written your manuscript and you've read it over and over again, the more you read it, the more you jump through the text and you're less likely to spot mistakes. I'm saying this from my own experience as well. So what you should do is you should give it to at least one or two people that haven't been involved in writing the manuscript and ask them to read them, read your paper again and check, make sure they emphasize anything in the paper that might be a mistake or anything that is unclear. Uh, to again ensure that your paper is as clear as possible before you submit it to us. And in addition, um, in terms of language, I would always recommend if English isn't your first language to potentially consider to give your paper to someone whose first language is English and ask them to cross check and read your manuscript to make sure that everything makes sense. From my own experience, using thesaurus and synonyms can lead to um, miscommunication and using words the wrong way. So do consider having a um, native English speaker potentially check your manuscript before submission. Um, 
and yeah generally yeah make sure you you do take all those boxes before you're actually done and you're ready to submit so one thing you need to prepare as well before submission is a cover letter so a cover letter is basically like a letter you're sending alongside your manuscript to the editor that's going to handle your manuscripts for peer review and it's meant to be a letter that kind of describes your paper again um, describes why it's important to the field and why you think it is suitable for the journal and it's a bit less formal than a short graph a short abstract so you can write up to um, we would always say try to stick to a page or maximum two pages um, a4 but um, and not too small font and try to really convey to the editor why you think your research is important what is the problem in the field you can use a few more words for that and also um, try to consider making sure you mention why is it important for um, for um, the journal so consider what's the audience of the journal um, why do you think that audience is interested ex explicitly in your results and again if the audience is more general then you might need to um, convey a bit more in your cover letter why do you think a general chemistry audience for example is will be interested in your research results um, and you can also um, refer to kind of future potential impact in the community and uh, in the general field of science so uh, it's a more informal way of trying to convey to the editor of why they should consider sending your paper out for peer review um, okay make sure um, when you address um, the letter it's addressed to you can address it to either the editor-in-chief or editorial board chair you can address it to an associate editor or you can also just address it to the journal in general uh, but do make sure that when you write your cover letter that it mentions the correct journal name i we all know that um the journal you might be submitting to um is not maybe your first choice you might have um, submitted your paper previously to a different journal and it has been rejected um, which is absolutely understandable but do make sure that when you resubmit a manuscript to a new journal that you actually change the name of the journal in the cover letter um, you might not you might think this is a common sense thing to do but we see this quite a lot that people forget in the moment where they're resubmitting um, to change this and it just it's not we wouldn't base a rejection on that of course not but it does it leaves the editor that's assessing a manuscript which kind of a negative um, feeling because they feel like you haven't put the effort in to make a small change like changing the journal name and it, it looks a bit sloppy and it might give a feeling of sloppiness when they're continuing to read the cover letter and the, your manuscript as well. So just to make sure that you, the editor is as neutral as possible and isn't annoyed by small mistakes like this, do make sure to actually check that the journal name mentioned in your cover letter is the correct one. Okay, then one other thing that you need to take into account is the graphical abstract as well. Um, it's not necessary to submit this at first stage but i always recommend that you do because um if you do submit it you might get comments from reviewers on your graphical abstract and advice on potentially how to improve it so with this in mind i would always recommend that you do submit this with the initial paper and have that ready and again a graphical abstract is basically what appears on the journal web page or on the issue um, together with the title so it's a short one or two sentences that describe your um, paper shorter than the general abstract in the paper and accompanied by an image and it's really very much there to attract the reader's attention so again as i say people would never see your graphical abstract without the title so do not feel the need to repeat anything in your title in the graphical abstract um, but really outline one or two of the key elements of your uh, of the results in your paper and what your research paper is about. Make sure it's very clear again. Don't use any kind of too specialized words or acronyms um, and really emphasize the key findings and importance of your work in as few words as possible. And really do make sure of the uh, make use of the image. 
um, use color uh, to emphasize things. It's free of charge to use color uh, and don't make things too small. Um, do have a look on the web pages of journals and have a look how big graphical abstracts are usually displayed. Uh, to get a feeling for how big will it actually be displayed and will any writing or any structures that I put in be actually visible to people or will they be too small and actually people lose interest in looking at it. So do have a look at this beforehand. Okay, then um, once uh, you're done with all that, the last thing you should take into account as well before you submit a paper is um, do have a look at related papers that potentially haven't uh, been published yet. First of all, um, do please avoid fragmentation of work. Um, do make sure that your um, the research paper you're submitting to a journal is a roundup story and you're not breaking up your research into lots of different small papers, fragmenting your work and actually breaking up and taking away from the importance maybe of the findings. Um, and do also, again, as I mentioned before you submit, um, as a last step, search the literature again for any very, very recent publications to make sure that your references are as, and state of the art that you mentioned in the paper are as up to date as possible. In, a, in addition, you might be working on a similar project that is related to the results in your paper, but you haven't actually pub published those results yet. So you might have um, articles um, that are currently submitted and in peer review or that are in preparation, but might be where the results are directly related to the results in this manuscript or articles that are kind of in press. Um, so for those, we would um, expect you to submit those with your manuscript as papers for the editor to be seen. Um, so you can, for example, just attach additionally an article that is currently in peer review you can cite it in your paper and in the reference list state that it's currently under peer review uh, just to make sure that the peer review process is as fair as possible and that um, the reviewer potentially and the editor have everything they need to make an assessment on this paper um, so what i can say now is um, now that you've looked at all of this, you're ready to submit your paper. So what does an editor actually do once you submit the paper? Um, the editor is there to manage the peer review, um, to mediate if there are any problems, and to also ensure fairness and quali quality as well, well as make a final decision on publication of your paper. Um, so the manuscript cycle, um, I'm realizing I'm a bit late, so I'm going to skip through a bit, but hopefully you can ask questions afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. So basically you submit your manuscript to us, it goes to an editor for initial assessment and um, who then makes a decision to either reject the paper on the grounds that maybe it's not in scope for the journal or also they don't feel like it's the right level the journal is looking for, or they might decide to send it out for peer review. If they send it out for peer review, they would assign it to at least two reviewers, active researchers in the field, um, and they would um, um, receive reports from those reviewers that will help them hopefully to make a decision. If they get split reports, they would go back and potentially assign um, an additional reviewer uh, to adjudicate who is able to see all the previous review reports and make an overall decision on a manuscript. Um, based on those, the re editor would then be able to make a decision either to reject a manuscript and potentially offer a transfer or also to um, send a manuscript for revisions. Um, which means it would come back to you with the reports and you have a chance to re respond to those reports and make potential changes to the manuscript um, as well as I in the end hopefully make a decision to accept the manuscript. There's also an appeals process that we're offering if you ever uh, feel like you've been unfairly um, your manuscript has been unfairly judged and that the decision was wrong, you can contact the editorial office and we do offer a process of appeal where you can formally send us a response to any comments and we can start an appeal process of a decision. Um, so generally peer review, um, what uh, might be interesting to you is when an editor chooses reviewers, 
what they take into account is the specialist knowledge, of course, of the reviewer. They should be specialist in the field of the paper that they're reviewing. And also what we take into account, what we have in our database is um, we have information on the speed and reliability and accuracy of those reviewers based on previous reviews they've um, supplied us with. So this is something we take into account as well to make sure that you get as good and as quickly a review as possible. And things that reviewers, we ask reviewers to take into account is things like, um, is the correct experimental work, is the experimental work presented correct? Is enough of it presented? Is the work a novel and has enough impact for the journal they're uh, reviewing it for? Is it suitable in general in terms of scope as well for publication in the journal? And then based on those things, they make a recommendation. Um, and questions that each editor asks as well is, is the research presented correct? Is it robust? Is it ethically sound? Are there any potential ethical problems with it? Um, is it understandable to the community what is actually described in the paper? Um, are the conclusions made actually um, um, backed up by the experimental data or is there actually experimental data potentially missing to back up those conclusions? Are there any new insights that the community will gain from this um, research record? And is it generally of interest to the readership of the journal? And so based on this, editors and reviewers make a decision on your manuscript. And so one thing that they are taking into account as well is if potentially your manuscript will be rejected from the journal. Um, one thing that we're quite keen on looking into is as well transfers. Um, so we might be looking at, for example, if your paper might not be suitable for chemical science, the editor might look at are there any other RSC journals that we feel your, your manuscript might be more suited to, that have, where the manuscript has a better chance of getting accepted, and they would potentially offer you this transfer at the decision stage, and it means that you don't have to prepare a lot of new um, you don't have to change much of your uh, submission, the files you've submitted for peer review, except for, of course, your cover letter and the journal name. And it may, means that by just clicking a button, you can directly transfer all your files and just upload and change a few and submit them to the new journal. And it saves you hopefully time and hopefully has a much better outcome in the peer review process afterwards. Um, okay. So when you're looking at revising your paper, there are a few things to take into account when you receive the reviewer comments. So make sure you stick to the deadline given for the revisions. If you can't email us, let us know, and we can extend the deadline as well. But make sure you um, stick to us or let us know because this avoids us having to chase us and you receiving unnecessary chases as well. Make sure you read each reviewer report carefully. If anything's unclear, do feel free to email us again and we can get back to the reviewer to clarify points for you. Uh, make sure you address all the comments in the reviewer reports and don't leave anything out. Um, be polite. I do appreciate that sometimes reviewer reports can be see, can be not necessarily polite or especially the written word sometimes can come across very more rude than maybe intended. Please do ignore any of these. We don't um, change any of our review reports um, in any of the language just because we want to avoid that we change any of the scientific meaning um, and scientific comments of the review reports. So please do just ig ignore any of that. Don't take anything as a personal offense. Just stay very um, neutral, be polite in your response, um, and provide as well a manuscript that is revised and hopefully highlights any changes you've made. So you can highlight it either in like highlighting the text with the changes and referring in your response to the reviewer comments to the highlighted text and the manuscript. That way you make it very clear when it goes back to the editor and potentially to a reviewer as well, um, what you've made, which changes you've made, and it makes it very easy for them to follow those and really puts them in a very positive mindset when they're looking at your response um, and your revised manuscripts. And yeah, do, as I said, take, to, do avoid to take any critical comments personally and really just try to be as neutral and professional as possible in your response. Okay, 
Uh, so if your manuscript does get accepted, what happens from our side is we would send your manuscript for data capture, which means that um, we would put all your um, your manuscript into the right template, the right format, which means that, yeah, if before you submit to us, you do not have to put in the right template, you do not have to make the references in the right format. This is all done by us after acceptance. Uh, we would then send it for editing um, of the language and we would then afterwards send you so-called galley proofs back. This is the edited document where you get a chance to look at it, make sure that the editing hasn't changed anything of the, any of the scientific meaning. And you might also receive some questions from us after the editing on things um, to check specifically or anything that needs um, revising or uh, checking and or including as well. And after those, you've revised, you've seen those proofs and you send us back your comments. We would apply those comments to the manuscript and it would then be published as an advanced article and then as soon as possible be published in an issue with page numbers so yeah last but not least one thing i just want to mention is make sure to take into account uh, good publishing practice um, make sure you read our author and ethical guidelines and to follow them as i mentioned before check that authorship is accurate for example as well if you have made more experience when you revised your manuscripts and this has been done by someone who wasn't part of the author list do consider does that person need to be added to the author list now and if so please do update the manuscript that you're resubmitting but also update the uh, scholar one or uh, on our submission system the list of authors to make sure everyone gets due recognition if needed avoid plagiarism and avoid as i mentioned fragmenting your work um, don't make any unsupported claims that your data doesn't actually support and only submit to one journal at a time. You should never submit your manuscript to more than one journal at a time. Um, so, and it, um, just going back to plagiarism, what that actually means is once a pay manuscript is published, that text is um, part of the publication record and you cannot, you should not just copy paste text from an old manuscript, even if it was your own that has been published uh, and use that for a new one, just changing some of the data or so, because you're that, with that you're breaching um, the um, kind of integrity of the published record. Um, so you need to make sure that you do not copy paste text, but you're rephrasing um, any reused portions of text that you're using in new publications. Equally, when you're writing a review article or also in your studies, if you're writing a thesis at the end of your research project, for example, do make sure if you're referencing um, research that has been done to not just copy paste some of the text. Do make sure you phrase everything in your own words because every, otherwise it is meant, this is called plagiarism and it means that you're stealing words from a published record and is unethical. Um, make also sure to cite any direct quotes, uh, uh, quotes by using quotation marks and again make sure that you clearly reference any sources. If you're reusing images, for example, if you're using a comparison image that you've used in a previous paper for something like basic graphene, uh, TEM image of a basic graphene material, and you're using that in several studies as a comparison, please do just make sure you reference where you've uh, first published this paper, this image. So that's very clear, just to make sure this uh, people don't think you're uh, duplicating data from a previous article without referencing that. And if you do want to reproduce figures and images in um, manuscript that you're submitting to a publisher that has been published before um, with another publisher, make sure you request permission to reproduce those figures and images as well. If you're ever unsure how to do that, please do just feel free to email us and we can um, direct you, point you in the right direction. And yeah, this is all based basically on us being part of the, um, the Committee on Publication Ethics and we are very much as part a member of this and Crossref, we are making sure that um, we are following those guidelines. And if you ever have concerns about a paper published by us that breaches those guidelines, do contact us as well. And we are looking into that together with our in-house publication ethics specialist. Uh, 
So yeah, as I said, if you do spot any problems with your own manuscript that has been published with us, uh, do make sure you contact us as quickly as possible so we can avoid any problems. If you've noticed you've forgotten a reference, to contact us as quickly as possible so we can make the changes before your paper gets actually published as an advanced article. Um, and if it has already been published, we can look into correcting the scientific record as well. We can publish a correction note that rectifies any problems that you might be seeing. Or also, if it's very serious, we can retract a paper as well. And if you're ever unsure, again, please do contact us and we can look into that. Um, last but not least, this is my last slide, I promise. Um, I just wanted to show you something that we've been working on um, and have just been rolling out across all our journals over the last month, which is our manuscript tracker. Um, this is something that we, our technology team has been working as one of the innovations I've been mentioning early on in my talk. So this is a tracker where basically when you submit a paper to us, the corresponding author receives an email with a link and hopefully they will share that with all of you as authors as well. If you don't receive it, please do ask the corresponding author that has submitted the paper to share that with you. And it's a link that allows you to uh, log into the system and see at every stage where your manuscript is at. So you should be able to log in and very quickly see by looking at the top line with the ticks um, at what stage of peer review your manuscript is currently at. And um, at the bottom, you can see a few more details on what's currently happening. If you ever feel like it gets stuck over a long time, you can contact our office as well. But initially, if you're uh, not sure what's currently happening and you're unsure if your paper is actually progressing at all, um, this is a really good way of, for you to check what's actually happening and what, what are currently the things that the editor is doing to see if your manuscript is progressing through the peer review process or not. OK, I think this was everything. I'm very sorry for running over time a little bit. Um, Thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been useful a, li a little bit to you at the different career stages that you're all at as well. And do, yeah, do please let me know if you have any questions at all. I'm happy to answer any now, but also later on, you can um, contact my journals or any of our staff as well. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Michelle, for giving such an important and insightful talk what to do and what not to do during the publication. Now I request uh, Monty Gogoi to ask the question so that we can answer all the raised uh, questions from the audience and participant. What to Monty? Thank you, sir. On behalf of our director, CSI and NIST, and the entire SRTP team, I would like to thank you, ma'am, for your such an informative lecture. We are indeed honored to hear you, ma'am. And there are a lot of questions in Zoom as well as in YouTube. With your permission, we would like to begin the question and answer session. Should be, ma'am? Yes, please. Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the first question is, what is more important, huge number of paper or a small number of good publications? Um, so I would always say um, a small number of good publications. I, I feel like it's a personal question probably to everyone, but I um, personally think it's more important not to publish a large number of papers, um, but it's more important to make sure that um, the publications um, are actually advancing the scientific record. And I think this is what I was referring to as well when I talk about fragmenting your work. Um, it's not so much important, um, I feel, to us um, that you cut your, cut your research into a lot of small papers and have a lot of publications, um, but to really, it's more important that you summarize your research into a like big story that gives a really good overall um, picture and shows the impact of your work as well. So um, I think that is important. But on the other side, I think it's also important to not um, deprioritize um, publications, for example, that are maybe not as positive as others. I know that um, a lot of research projects that we are, I've been working on and other, you will be working on, not every research project will end up in um, extremely positive um, results and um, advancing the fields because, of course, not everything works that you're doing. And it's important as well that if you have findings um, that are 
maybe not as positive, but are still advancing the scientific record and are worth sharing with the community that I think these should be shared with the community personally, um, because you showing that something doesn't work means that other research groups will then be able to see um, this doesn't work and then might avoid other research groups wasting a lot of time on trying to do the same experiments and coming to the same conclusions in lots of other labs all over the world. And it kind of helps everyone else to advance together and work more together on and share results, even if they're maybe not as positive as others. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yes, ma'am, definitely. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is uh, how to distinguish between real and predatory journals? Um, okay, I think. So I know this is quite difficult sometimes. Um, so one of the things that I've mentioned before is um, what you can do to avoid predatory journals is to go with a trusted publisher, with a publisher that you know pub publishes trusted journals, um, that you feel like you have experience with where, where they would not publish any predatory journals. That's definitely one thing to take into account when you make a decision on where to publish. But this said, not every new publisher publishes pre predatory journals. And so I know that is sometimes very cool to identify those. Um, so, yeah, let me think about that. So I think, yeah, it's, it's important to uh, look at what has been published in those journals um, to make a ju judge on your own. Is the research um, valid? Is, is it good, good science? Can you, um, do you feel like um, the your own judgment as a reader do you feel like the experimental data presented is solid and supports the conclusions to make your own judgment on is the science presented actually good research and do i trust this journal to publish in it um, so these are things you can take into account um, i wonder if my colleagues in um, in india have any other comments on that any experiences with how to potentially distinguish that Thank you, Sam, for your informative answer. The next question is, could you please suggest some open source software to do grammar and spelling check for a research article? Um, yeah, if you just want to do a very basic grammar and spelling check, of course, you can use just writing programs such as Word. Uh, because, yeah, just make sure it's ticked and it's actually on, so it does an initial grammar and spelling check. Um, if you want to go beyond that, and um, I, as I mentioned, it's always good to have native speakers to look at a manuscript. Um, but if you can also use um, language adding at language editing services, of course, these are not for free. These would cost money. So you could, there are um, language editing services that we are recommending as well that you can find on our author port portal um, that you can use. Um, but if you're looking for a free option, I think the best thing is to use writing programs um, that initially have a spelling check and grammar check and help you with that. And then maybe also just see if you find colleagues in the community that would be willing to help you with just giving a paper a quick read um, that would do it for free. Um, anyone you've, you've met, for example, at a conference that you feel like has very good English um, or also any English native speakers that can help you with that. Otherwise, yeah, if you do want to use a professional language editing check uh, service, they do cost money. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, can we ask you one more question? Yes, of course. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, as plenty of research articles are available, so how can we make our research articles unique? So to avoid plagiarism, of course. Yeah. So yeah, there. I think there. There are two two parts to this question. Of course, to avoid plagiarism, yeah, you should try to make it unique in terms of making sure that the language is different. And this is something that um, to if you're struggling with that, again, um, you could ask someone who's more experienced in writing papers to help you with that. Um, what you could do is as well. Just um, I think one of the things you should always do is or 
quite early on in your career, read as much um, research literature as you can, because the more you read, the more you get used to the language, and the easier it will become for you as well later on to write papers and to um, maybe write papers in different styles as well. And um, otherwise, yeah, do ask people to help you if you're struggling to rephrase things. On the other hand, I know that um, the public, there are more and more papers being published every year. And of course, you want to make your paper unique and stand out for readers to find it and potentially read and cite your paper. So for that, of course, it's very important to, as I said, make your paper as discover as possible. So for example, um, for um, your title and your graphic abstract and your abstract really take into account to what um, attracts readers, how can I make um, make people aware of what is actually the importance of my paper in those short things, because a lot of people use now search engines, they use um, databases or Google as well to find research. And the first thing they see is basically the title and the abstract or graphical abstract. So make sure you use those opportunities to really convey as best as possible in very simple language. Um, to people why is your paper important to make it stand out and then of course you can use other means as well to promote your work afterwards you can share it with your colleagues if you've published a paper and you think it might be um, important to them share it with your colleagues um, you can share it on social media as well um, you can if you publish with one of our journals and you share it on social media you can tag our journal in your post and then we would um, reshare it. So for, for example, if you tweet about your publication with us and you tag our journal account, all our journals have Twitter accounts, um, we would then retweet and um, basically promote it to all our followers as well and give you more visibility. Um, so we'd be happy to do that. And then, yeah, promote it by going out into the community, give talks, talk about your research, make sure people um, give them the DOI so they can quickly find your papers if they're interested in reading them. And yeah, really try to promote the research on your own as well through these different means. Thank you, ma'am, for so patiently responding to the queries from the participants and giving such elaborative and nice answers. And it was our pleasure and honor to listen to you, ma'am. We are sure that all the participants are highly enlightened by your lecture. And uh, we are glad to share that live platforms in Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook are filled with appreciative comments for your lecture, ma'am. And we look forward to listening more from you in the future. Now handing over the session to Mr. Sahar, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I just want to thank you all as well before we go hand over. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me talk. And thanks for all the nice questions. And as I said, please, um, we will try to answer more of the questions afterwards as well. Um, if we can and do please if you have any questions at all feel free to also email me through any of the journal inboxes and i'm happy to help with any questions you might have as well thank you very much thank you thank you ma'am thank you lisa and monty for conducting question and answer session and uh, thank you for dr michela for giving all the queries uh, answer uh, patiently and we will compile all the other questions which uh, cannot be put to you right now uh, and send it to you for, for the answer. Now I request uh, Dr. my colleague Dr. Arupai to propose a vote of thanks. Okay, mm, thank you Vishwajit. Uh, it's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. Uh, on behalf of Director CSA and East and the whole SRTP team, we offer our sincere gratitude to Dr. Michela uh, for taking out your valuable time and reaching the program with your exemplary talk on the topic of how to publish do's and don'ts when writing a research article. So I, I strongly believe that this uh, was uh, really of different flavor and especially different from uh, the normal talks and especially as you mentioned it's uh, from a publisher's point of view which we seldom get to know uh, also you have given an excellent coverage on uh, uh, rigorous fair and efficient procedure for selection of research articles and what to avoid which is very important uh, for researchers like us uh, to maximize the possibility of acceptance uh, in uh, the RSC journals or for that matter in any journal 
So you also discussed about the single blind, double blind, and transparent or open system of reviewing, uh, which I uh, believe that uh, it's very important for uh, the, the researchers who are doing research for a long time, and especially the young researchers. Uh, I think double blind system is a boom. So it gives them opportunity to be not judged and uh, give them the opportunity of a fair publication, although I think the rules are very relaxed and fair already. So thank you once again for this informative talk. Uh, we look, look forward uh, to hear from you more, Doctor. Uh, I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Director CSA and East, Jian Shastri, for organizing this summer research training program and giving this uh, excellent platform for being virtually connected and uh, spreading knowledge in this tough time. I thank Dr. Rajesh from RSC and all others from RSC representatives in uh, India for being associated and helping us throughout uh, this uh, program. I also wish to express my gratitude to all the SRTP team members for providing their constant support and working tirelessly towards making this program successful. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the participants connected to all the three platforms, that is Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube Live, and for their active participation into this session. Thank you, everyone. Stay happy, stay safe, and stay home. Thank you.